here, Connie. Hi, Matt. Hi, Hijin. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, we are How waiting for people to join the uh, join the webinar. The webinar is now live, and I see people are joining. Um, I'm also going to start broadcasting. Uh, I'm also going to start the recording, and I'm going to start broadcasting on Facebook. Um, in the meantime, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to start where. Um, <sighs> moment. How are you feeling, Hijan? You better? Yes, yes. But everybody can hear you, so please be careful. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. We are officially live. Okay. Uh, I'm oh, want fantastic. To welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, I'm going to kindly ask the panelists to uh, mute when they're not talking. Um, my name is Hijin Kim, and I am the Regional Key Population Officer at the Aten Rights Alliance for Southern Africa. Just for a uh, for um, the transparency, I want to let you know that we're recording this webinar, so we, may, we are able to make it available afterwards. And we are also, uh, right now, live streaming it on, um, on uh, YouTube as well uh, for, uh, for others, and it'll be available on, on YouTube afterwards as well. Um, we, I would like to thank all of the panelists for making the time. I also would like to thank the Open Society Foundation for making the funds available for us to do this series of webinars, which is the first of a series of webinars that we called Treat Us Right. So if you're tweeting about the webinar, please use the hashtag, hashtag Treat Us Right, because we really are going to dig deep into uh, uh, issues that people who use drugs face. Uh, and try to connect the lived experiences of people who use drugs with the with policies. Um, uh, Arasa is very honored to have uh, Matt from Coact facilitate uh, this webinar. So I'm going to hand it over to to Matt. I do want to say if you have any questions in between, we we're going to have presentations first and a Q and A afterwards. There is a Q&A function in the Zoom, so you can already ask questions uh, in the Q&A. You can also put comments and questions in the chat. I will monitor that and our panelists will address that. Um, and uh, we will also have a poll at some point come up and we'll have uh, uh, to sort of evaluate what people think. Uh, but uh, with further ado, no. Uh, without any delays, I'm going to hand it over to Matt to start the actual webinar and introduce our amazing panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hejin, um, and welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, this is part of the series called Treat Us Right, and I'm going to start screen sharing the uh, presentation that we will be working through. Um, so, um, uh, the, the webinar series is called Treat Us Right, as Hijin has, has said, and it's been put on by ARASA, um, which is part of a, an ongoing partnership around promoting drug user organising and harm reduction in Southern Africa, which I've been really pleased to work alongside, um, alongside ARASA. This webinar is particularly focused on safer injecting and needle and syringe programmes. This is part of a four webinar series. So in the next following two weeks, we're also going to be looking at opiate overdose and naloxone and opioid substitution therapy like methadone and buprenorphine and also drug policy. Now each webinar will have a, a guest speaker and also the webinar is informed by a report um, produced by ARASA, which uh, Natalie Rose and myself contributed to. Um, and um, we'll be discussing that, and Natalie will be discussing that as we um, move forward. So in terms of this webinar, let me just go to, to do some introductions. So my name, for people who don't know me, is Matt Southwell. Um, I'm currently working half-time as the project executive for Euro which is the European network of people who use drugs. 
And I also work as a technical advisor in international development, particularly specialising in harm reduction, drug treatment and the interface with community mobilisation. So let me go to our guest speaker for today from South Africa, which is Connie Van Staten. You need to come off mute. Sorry, thank you. There we go. Good afternoon, guys. Um, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, be part of this webinar and to share my experiences and what we've um, done on the, on the street level with uh, drug users in South Africa. So can I go ahead with the presentation? Well, or we'll, come to, we'll come to that uh, a little bit later, Connie. Okay. So let me, um, uh, I was mentioning that we have Natalie Rose, who's been a, well, I think many people will know her from her lead uh, work in the region. Natalie, would you just like to introduce people to yourself and maybe just tell people about the report in this one? So hi everyone and uh, hi to the panelists and all the other people participating in this webinar. So um, I am Natalie Rose. I am currently from Mauritius, uh, living there. And I have been uh, working in uh, um, uh, civil society organization um, um, in uh, the field of HIV and, uh, and uh, harm reduction for the last uh, 15 years. And now for, I mean, the last couple of years, I've been working more like um, uh, independently as an in independent consultant. Uh, but I have had the opportunity of working with a lot of organization, whether in Southern Africa or um, Western Africa. So I'm uh, looking forward to the uh, exchanges. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Natalie. Look, it's a real um, exciting thing for me to work with such exciting people doing such exciting work in a, in a really key region of the world. Now let me, hang on, how do I get this to move on? Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about how the webinar is going to go today. So we're going to uh, start off just by setting the scene in terms of some definitions and terminology around needle and syringe program. Then I'm going to show you a video interview that I conducted with uh, Natalie a little bit earlier, where she tells you about the report that we were involved in producing with ERASA. Then we're going to look at some, some risks of injecting and we're going to show you a video which is two drug users essentially doing everything wrong. And uh, we're going to ask you to try to spot the risks that they're, that they're taking. We're going to watch the video twice the first time to try and see if you can spot the mistakes. And then the second time we'll work through and try to point out the mistakes to you. Then we'll come back and summarise what the key risks are faced by people who inject drugs. Then we're going to talk about, um, in, in fact, actually, the, sorry, then the, the guest speaker, sorry, I changed the order slightly. The guest speaker uh, comes straight away after Natalie, Connie, just to be clear. So it's uh, Natalie, then the guest speaker. And then we come into the risks and then hotspot mapping and then looking at the practicalities of injecting. OK, and then we come on to the very important part at the end, which is um, the question answer session with, with you. So just in terms of looking at the material that backs up this seminar or this webinar, there are two key resources that I would recommend to you. The first one is the Safer Injecting Handbook. This is produced by Exchange Supplies. I'll share a link with you in the chat in a while. Um, and it is, a, it is now in its ninth edition, but it's routinely updated. Whenever I do Safer Injecting Training, it's the handout I recommend because it's such a rigorous piece of work. And if you adopt it as your training resource, it also means it's being regularly updated for you. So you don't end up with a dating uh, resource, which is very important in an area like drugs that changes so frequently. The other one, which I will also share in the chat, is an article that I wrote with some colleagues from the WHO, including actually Sean Shelley as well from, uh, from South Africa. And in this article, we tried to summarize the current state of the art in terms of what the issues are and what the key responses are around harm reduction. And so it's really sort of a very contemporary statement backed up by the WHO, uh, including authors from the WHO as well well and uh, also professor lisa meyer who was a, a fantastic uh, collaborator on the article so 
when we talk about needle and syringe program, it's about understanding that it is one part of a re repertoire of interventions that are delivered by, uh, that are recommended by the United Nations, by the WHO, uh, UNAIDS and UNODC, and are recognized as a core set of 11 interventions uh, that are targeted at people who use drugs. And what we recognize is needle and syringe program opiate substitution therapy, and the provision of naloxone with supporting peer education. These are the core essential parts that should be part of every harm reduction program. The additional elements like ART, HIV counseling, all of these other critical parts are also important, but we recommend the UN is clear that NSP, OST and naloxone are absolutely central. Also importantly, the UN is highlighting these critical enablers, recognizing that harm reduction doesn't happen in isolation and you no know, impacts of stigma and discrimination, but also the positive response of community mobilization from people who use drugs is part and parcel of a broader harm reduction response. So what is needle and syringe program? Let's be clear about it. We used to talk about this term needle exchange and that re related to the fact in the very early adopters of needle needle exchange and let's remember who adopted needle and syringe program first it was the junkies bund in rotterdam back in 1982 prior to hiv in fact as part of a response to hepatitis b and the junkies bund was um, the, one of the first drug user group, the first hard drug user group in europe so remembering that nsp has always been at its heart a response from people who use drugs to people who use drugs. It's never been solely a professional intervention. However, what happened was that the drug user groups in Rotterdam moved back from doing NSP and the professionals stepped in. Now at that point, it was even before HIV, they had this idea that every needle given out had to be uh, an exchange for a needle given in. And this was seen as part of the safeguarding process so that needles didn't spill out. The problem is that people don't always have needles. Sometimes you have to drop them when the police are coming. Sometimes, you know, you may, no, you may, you may not have, no, you may be traveling away from home. There may be many reasons why you don't have equipment. So that's why we now talk about needle and syringe programs, not needle exchanges. We recognize that the process of distribution and the process of recovery and disposal are both very important, but they shouldn't be conditional. They shouldn't be connected with one another. We'll come back to disposal as the, as the final part of this uh, discussion. So to be clear about what NSPs do or needle and syringe programs do, this is from the Kenyan uh, program. And they're highlighting that firstly, of course, to give out clean needles and syringes is a key issue. To remove the contaminated needles and syringes is another key issue and then to make sure that those needles go on to be properly distributed so it's very important that NSPs are connected into the wider clinical waste uh, process. It's also important that people understand how to use the, the equipment so it's not just about having needles and syringes it's also understanding how they're used and how they can be effectively done and even 30 years into having needles and syringes in my country I still find people injecting in you know, in places in their bodies that just completely show they don't understand how their circulation works and therefore how effective safer injecting can take place because actually our bodies are pretty complex and once you start injecting you really need to understand how our bodies work and particularly how the circulation system works to be able to interact with it and not put yourself at extreme risk. Also importantly, NSPs or needle and syringe programs are the entry point to the wider system. Once you do needle and syringe programs well, then that provides a, an entry point into the wider healthcare systems. So needle and syringe programs need to be highly non-judgmental, welcoming, uh, supportive places that draw people in and in acts as a wider entry point into the wider drug treatment, harm reduction and healthcare and social care system. If you want to know how to set up a needle and syringe program, then this is your key resource. It's been written by the WHO, UNAIDS and the UN Office of Drugs and, Cr and Crime. 
It's called a guide to starting and managing needle and syringe programs. It's a really excellent resource. It's accessible, it's practical, and really anybody running an, a needle and syringe program should have this on their desk and should be highly familiar with it as a resource. If you need to justify it and justify uh, needle and syringe programs to your commissioners or to your donors, this is also a really good way of showing that you're operating with the best practice standards. Now, at the very end of this uh, uh, webinar, I'm going to also introduce you to another WHO resource that gives you the evidence that backs up NSP. So this is how to do it, and we'll end with the evidence that shows that it works. So now we're going to come out of screen share, and I'm going to show you a video. Oh, hang on. I'm sorry, this is going to require me to be technically. So I'm now going to show you a video. So this is a video of Natalie uh, talking to us about the report that I've mentioned called Don't Treat Us As Outsiders. It's a report produced by RASA and Natalie explains the report <clears throat> and um, uh, talks you through it uh, in this, hang on in this interview uh, there was this report don't treat us as outsiders so uh, it includes uh, basically um, um, drug policies drug prohibition what it is uh, uh, how it uh, all started in the global north and how it afterwards came to uh, the African region and the southern African region what are the global policies now and also how are civil society reacting to that what are the services health and social services for people who use drugs and how is the debate around drug policy reform and also the report includes a part where there are the voices of people who use drug in uh, five different countries uh, where really the live experiences of how it is to be a drug user in, uh, in uh, an African country. So uh, the first uh, needle and syringe program started uh, um, around 2006, uh, seven uh, in Mauritius, uh, where I come from. And then it also um, uh, afterwards, and I mean, I have to say that uh, with the, with the uh, the support of the global of the global fund, uh, things did uh, change uh, a lot because the global fund has the they come with the funding and they're like, okay, this and these uh, initiatives are really uh, uh, important uh, in your country with this uh, uh, specific epidemic and where where the epidemic is driven or mostly or exclusive or, or yeah mostly or like when when there is a, a link be, be between um, drug drug use or injecting drug use and HIV, so then we started seeing programs in other countries like uh, um, uh, Tanzania and and uh, and Kenya and um, and uh, I mean if we, if we look at South Africa also and then if we look at the um, uh, at the other countries that we're mentioning in the report, uh, in, in Mozambique, they started uh, they started uh, uh, the needle and syringe program. I mean, it's it hasn't been a long time, but still they 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 they're doing it. And um, I, I mean, Seychelles also uh, has started it a few years back. And uh, I know that. Uh, uh, the partners in, in Zimbabwe are trying to push for, for needle and syringe program, but so far they're just in the process of, uh, of uh, writing their, 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 their national drug master plan. And then there will be some, uh, some uh, like whether the, where pl the plan will be, will be like the, the first draft will be on, civil society partners will be able to add in some information, but uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, in 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 uh, in practice, uh, they're not there yet. Uh, and also in in uh, South Africa, the interesting thing about uh, about it in South Africa is that there is also this um, um, uh, peer-driven initiatives, and I think this is. Uh, uh, quite specific about South Africa. I mean, if you have to talk about how it started here in Mauritius, uh, it, it wasn't the case. It was really like uh, um, 
a more formal uh, uh, approach with the um, uh, Ministry of Health and then NGOs, but at the beginning, the, the peer-driven approach wasn't, wasn't there. Uh, but it's very interesting to see that uh, now uh, there is this approach where uh, peers go in the community and they, uh, and they really um, uh, are, 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 are really a part of the of the service delivery. With regards to Mozambique specifically, I know that uh, not so long ago, I mean, uh, Matt, when you went there and you did the, you met the different uh, users uh, uh, and you did the, the, the interviews, et cetera, uh, they were not there yet. But uh, now they have launched the needle and syringe program. Uh, the, uh, the organization, um, that's working on it is uh, UNIDOS, and uh, now they have, uh, um, I mean, the, the, there is needle and syringe program, um, and uh, I think they are targeting about 500 uh, clients. So I'm not sure to what extent it's really uh, covering the, uh, answering to the, to the needs, but um, I think that um, in terms of drug, drug policy, drug services uh, in the region, things, don't usually move very fast, so I think it's a very uh, it's a, it's a good thing that things are starting, and it's always good to use it and then to try to move forward from what's from what's already um, being done. In a country where uh, the the conversation has not taken place, it might be uh, sometimes uh, seen as a challenge to just as a challenge just uh, bring in uh, peer user peer user networks and then have them in of course uh, when we have seen the different models we know that um, when peers are involved they can go into places that nowhere else can go but then uh, if I think that the other model is also interesting in the sense that uh, sometimes it can be counterproductive if you come forward with something that is uh, considered to be uh, like uh, too extreme, if I use the, the words that we've, we've been hearing sometimes, but like to do things gradually, like starting to use, to, to and of course it depends on the context, but starting with the more formal approach and getting people to 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 uh, to get used to it, uh, to see the also the um, the results in term in terms of uh, prevalence rate, uh, uh, be it um, HIV or or hepatitis C, I mean incidence rates uh, rather, and uh, and then gradually getting the peers in. I mean, th this is basically uh, I might be much for, much more familiar with this gradual uh, um, improvement from the formal one to the peer one because this is what we've seen here in the country. Sometimes, if you start with the formal approach and then you want to to be more um, um, uh, you want it to be more uh, peer driven then it also happens that um, uh, the, the formal approach, um, it, it can be sometimes difficult to move forward because uh, the formal approach is seen as something that's working. So um, uh, we cannot uh, now put uh, people who use drug to work in. And again, this is also about uh, the perception that the authorities have of the people who, who use drug is like, uh, are they really just people who need services and can do nothing more? Or do they really see um, the, the, um, the uh, people who use drugs as uh, being uh, empowered and being um, connected with the community and having a role to play in, instead of just being um, um, uh, receiving the, the, the service delivery like passively. So uh, Fantastic. Apologies for the um, problems. I didn't realize that if I muted, I cut the sound off and then, yeah, then we went into a whole series of problems just to prove that we really are live. So I also managed to pick up the wrong uh, version of that video, which didn't have subtitles. So we'll send that version out so that people uh, have another chance to listen to that again. I think the what we just listened to really highlights um, the importance of this dynamic of peer work and what Natalie really highlighted was this 
relationship between some people starting with a very professional model of NSP and then having this journey of adding in peer work and becoming more and more community involved. And then we see other examples, and I think Natalie quite rightly highlighted South Africa as the real pioneer and example of this, where people start from the very get-go with um, a peer-led approach. Now, there are challenges and difficulties to the two different models. Um, however, we are very privileged to have Connie uh, Van Staden with us. Now, Connie is, um, so I'm just trying to do this screen share thing. Um, so Connie um, is from the South African network of people who use drugs. And as, um, as Natalie highlighted in her presentation, in her video, that South Africa has been a real pioneer of, um, of leading with, from a peer perspective. So I'm gonna hand over to Connie, who is going to um, um, take us through what's happening in Southern Africa. So over to you, Connie. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for that uh, beautiful video and all the work that you've done, Matt. Yeah, to, to talk about NSP in South Africa, um, we did a huge formative assessment uh, before 2016 and officially started delivering services um, through a project to give um, needle and syringes to the public. And it was still very controversial in South Africa, but we grabbed it with both hands and, and we ran with it. Um, we had a lot of issues um, initially when it comes to delivering the services, obviously, you know, to get ethical approval and so on, um, but we managed to get that. And what we're talking about second, well, basically second station, uh, needle and syringes. Thank you, Matt. Like, there's four places where we started off to give needle and syringes as a second base where we can uh, give the needle and syringes to the community. One was, as you see there, dealer NSP is where we actually got into a partnership with the dealers. And whenever guys went to the dealers to get their shot or their daily dose or whatever, the ones that didn't have syringes, they would be given out. Then the second one was the hotspots, um, needle and syringe programs. Those were all the places where drug users congregate, not just where they live, also where they purchase their drugs. There will be um, um, a champion in the community that always had a, an excess of syringes with them, and they will also always be able to get from them. Also, the community members, like I said, that goes with um, the hotspots and like the key um, champions in the community. Also like satellite um, NSPs, there, if you see, there's a drop-in center. We were very successful with our drop-in center. And what a lot of people don't understand, by giving out needle and syringes, it's not just giving out the needle and syringe. That is a point of contact where you can like Natalie and Matt has said previously, that you can interact and communicate with the, com um, the community members or the service beneficiaries, and then they will tell you what they need, or you know you can um, introduce other harm reduction products to them and try and help them. Matt, can you go to the next slide, please? Then tracing and distributing of, sorry, but tracing and discarding of needle and syringes. When it comes to the return of commodities, as in the slide there, the needle and syringes, it was a very big problem in South Africa when we started. Um, we had a big problem with the return rate of syringes. We, I think we started and it went down to like a 20% because we had a big issue with law enforcement, especially they thought it was still a very controversial subject, giving out needle and syringes. And 
because of stigma and discrimination, they came down on the users in a very big way. So whenever the users saw law enforcement, they discarded the syringes wherever they were. Um, basically, what we decided to do after a while with interaction with the community and a lot of work, we managed to bring that exchange rate or basically the return rate of the needle and syringes up to over 80%. Thank you, Matt. You can go to the next slide. And then this last slide of mine is a, a showcase to, to, to basically say how important it is to mobilize the community. The picture there you guys can see, that's a soccer team. They are all homeless drug users. Um, and basically to try and get the homeless people to get them dignified and to make them feel like they are worth something again. I think we can really look at, at sports maybe as, as, a, as a medium because that bridges um, language, gender, age, religion, um, even race. It, it bridges all those barriers that most people find when it comes to um, delivering service to a homeless substance using community. Then the last slide, please, Matt. Then what, what are we looking at? We're basically looking at, at a new normal in, in this very challenging time. When it comes to delivering needle and syringe uh, programs, also to mobilize the community, Things have changed a lot in, in, in the last couple of months. We need to reimagine how we're going to, you know, reduce the risks to people that inject drugs, how we can um, implement harm reduction in a better way. And we need to make the homeless community feel like they are worth something, you know, like it's, it's worth our time to spend with them. The highlights in important of peer-led initiatives cannot be quantified. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Connie. That's excellent. In fact, I didn't want to come out of screen share. I want to stay in the screen share. So um, I'm just going to go back a little bit because I realised I jumped over um, something. Ooh, jump back too far. So I just wanted to just to be clear about some definitions before we go on to some of the practicalities of safer injecting. So I don't know if you've seen the, the two top corners. This is the universal sign of uh, needle and syringe programs. It's used in many places where you want to give a message to people who inject drugs to say, hey, this pharmacy or this drop-in centre or this um, uh, different venue has needles and syringes available without telling everybody else. And this sign or variations on this sign, these two, the red and green arrow, with uh, sometimes it looks slightly different. But as injecting drug users, what we know is when we see this sign, this is where we can get needles and syringes. We talk about this concept of a fixed site NSP, and this is often linked with a drop-in center. Now, these are the bases often from where other activities take place. So you can have nurses there offering wound care treatment. It can have uh, access to a doctor who might be able to prescribe antibiotics if you've got an injecting related injury. If you're maybe moving from injecting in low risk sites to high risk injecting sites, nurses can often you, offer you helpful training uh, around that. Uh, fixed sites can also be an important place where you can deliver training to drug users. So one concept we talk about is the idea of, um, of lived outreach. So it's this idea that um, as we learn things, we go back and live our life among other peers and then we share the knowledge. So if we come on a training course about safer injecting, then when we go back into our community, we're likely to share that information as it becomes relevant. As we talked about earlier, there's a really importance of 
NSPs or needle and syringe programs being the platform for an access into wider uh, harm reduction drug treatment and healthcare services. And also, this is often where you'll store the clinical waste, the used needles and syringes in bins, ready to be uh, taken away to be incinerated. However, drug use doesn't neatly take place all linked around where you put your fixed site NSP. You obviously try to put your fixed site in the best, most central location or in a very accessible place for transport links or possibly alongside a large open drug scene. But there's always going to be other places where people are using drugs, you no know, people where people are using in more remote models. So then the fixed site becomes like your headquarters from which you can deliver a range of low threshold interventions. So outreach models, satellite, and so in fact, uh, um, uh, Connie was telling us about both secondary needle and syringe programs, those delivered by dealers or drug users, satellites where it's delivered through our partners. In the UK, we have a lot of pharmacy based needle and syringe programs where we can go into the local community chemist and get a pack of needles and syringes. In some contexts, people take out vans and run mobile centers. In the UK now, we can have online sales being delivered to us, which is a new innovation uh, post COVID developed by Exchange Supplies. And again, dispensing machines are used in Berlin and in uh, Florence and various different places around the world. So these are the sort of different technical forms of needle and syringe program. Fixed site is the center with low threshold hubs that are defined or chosen based on what you're trying to reach. So, one of the methods we often use is this method of outreach. Again, this comes from the Kenyan manual, and it's just about highlighting that outreach as a mechanism is a very valuable way of connecting our fixed site needle and syringe programs with people living in drug using hotspots. I won't read all of these because you can read it yourself, but it's again just highlighting the fact that outreach is a way of taking materials out and then connecting people and bringing them back in and then uh, working with partners to do networking and advocacy to create the environment within which this work takes place. So, just jumping too fast. Okay, so now I'm just taking, I was very fortunate to work with um, a number of partners in Nigeria uh, last year. Uh, where Nigeria has been gearing up to run a very exciting needle and syringe pilot funded by the Global Fund, a key partner that Natalie highlighted in often investing in needle and syringe programs. But Nigeria had, is, unfortunately, their, their pilot was stopped by COVID because it impacted on getting needles and syringes into the country. But what's so exciting about Nigeria is that this is a program where the government are leading with, a, with SFH as the, the lead a global fund partner, but drug users through the drugs and uh, the Duran network are actually doing a lot of the frontline delivery. So it's professional partners backed up by the government, but working with drug users at that front line. And this is the tool that they developed to highlight how you would go and look at a hotspot, what methods you would use to analyze that hotspot to then decide what type of needle and syringe program is best suited for that setting. So it can be like socially mapping the area, understanding what resources exist, understanding what, you know, how the layout is. You can go in and do a hotspot analysis and I'll give you a checklist for that in a moment. You can also do contact mapping, which is networking through peers, also called snowballing to reach people. And it's also important to look at the, the drug patterns. One of my big criticisms has been internationally that we often buy needles and syringes in very, very large quantities before we check what types of needles and syringes people actually need on the ground. So we end up with people using needles and syringes designed for intramuscular injection to intravenously inject drugs that really should be using much, much smaller these types of insulin needles rather than the huge green and blue needles that are actually designed for intramuscular injection. So 
once you then go into a hotspot, then you want to look in very much detail. And, and again, it's important not just to rush into an area and think that you no know, rushing in with a sack of needles and syringes is the right way to work. The first intervention is to talk to the community, engage the local community, understand what drugs people have been uh, using, understand, you know, are people smoking, are they injecting, you know, what equipment are they using, understand what's going on, are, who else is mixing in that environment, how are women taking place in this setting, how are younger users taking place in this environment. That gives you the information to choose which type of NSP you want to use in terms of starting to have what we would call an, ad, an outreach plan that really maps all of the hotspots in the area that you're targeting and has a regular outreach plan that takes you out into those hotspots to engage people who use drugs. And that's very quickly caught me up with where I was meant to be at this point. So what I want to do now is to move into a more um, practical discussion of the process of safer injecting itself. So I'm going to show you a video and this is me and another drug user called Mick uh, Webb who some of you might know. Um, let me get rid of this one. Okay, just make sure I've got the subtitles this time. Right, so I'm going to show you a video now. And um, oh, hang on, I've not done so, I've not done screen share. Right, so this is a, oh, have I come out of this properly? Sorry, I'm not making sure I'm, oh, share is not, I didn't press the share button, that's what I failed to do. Okay, so I'm going to show you a two minute video and this is uh, two drug users called Dim and Dumb, which is two names for being stupid. And these are two drug users who are, have gone out, one of them went out to get needles and syringes, the other one went out to get heroin, and this is them coming back to plan together um, to take their drugs. Now what I want you to, to look for is what risks are they taking? Okay, so what risk do you think they're taking? We're going to watch it once, and so don't say anything to the rest of the audience, and then we'll come back, and then I'll ask uh, uh, Connie to help me tell you what these two idiots uh, did wrong. Hey, Jim. How's it going? How's it going? Mm. I managed to score some heroin. Ah, uh, it's coming in slow, but Well, you think that's bad, uh, dear Mike, to put that in my mouth after the dealer spat it out and put it in my hand. Oh, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. Anyway, how did you get on with the needles and swimmers? Uh, not so well. Every, all the pharmacists closed. Um, oh. I could only beg, borrow, and steal a couple of, uh, 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 kind of, kind of barrels, kind of pens. They didn't okay. tell me what, what, what have you got? That's what I've got. So you've got, um, and uh, where do you get, I got those from Wiki? Yeah. Okay, and uh, I think that might be used. Well, I think we probably have been used, but they just can't be chooses at this time of night. Okay, and, and they're pretty sharp? They seem like pretty sharp, yeah. Okay, well let's, um, let's just give it a, I've just boiled this kettle, so let's just, um, let's, uh, let's just give them a bit of a clean, with some oil and water, that will, that will sort them out. Let's just, yeah, they've got a bit of blood and stuff in them. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. That should sort them out. So, Dim, let's have a, we've both managed to get hold of some heroin. Let's have a little bit of a drink to uh, celebrate our good luck. Right. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. Right, let's put up this heroin. Let's give it a go. Okay, so let's take the same amount each, yeah? yeah the same amount each, mate. Hang on. Yeah, no, that's about all right, isn't it? You ready to go? Yeah. My injection site's a bit dirty. Let me just clean that up a bit. Right, that's right. Let's go. You ready to go? Yeah, go on. Hello. Right. So. Let's watch that again. 
and Connie, maybe you can come off mute as well and just uh, we can just give people some advice about what these two numpties are not doing right in terms of their uh, drug using practice. So I'm going to stop it as we see key risks and Connie, feel free to, 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 to jump in and share. Uh, thank you, Matt. Hi, Tim. How's it going? Mm. Well, I managed to score some heroin. Uh, we can quickly stop yeah. there, Matt. Um, yeah, we look at where he takes the stuff out of his mouth. You know, it's been scientifically proven that the human mouth have more bacteria and germs in than uh, a dog. So, you know, they're probably going to handle that packet that came out of his mouth, also out of the dealer's mouth, and then they're going to handle it and cook it up, and that bacteria and germs goes on their, on their equipment, on their gear. Right, and these days we also need to recognize this is a new risk for people who use, inject drugs. This is the risk of COVID-19. Because, of course, in that transition, the drug dealer took the drugs out of their mouth, put them into Dum's hand, who put them in his mouth, put them into Dim's hand. So therefore, we're now, we've now seen potentially COVID spread to three different people in a, in a line. Okay, we'll carry yes. on. They might have put that in my mouth after the dealer spat it out and put it in my hand. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. Anyway, how did you get on with the needles and swimmers? Uh, not so well. Every, all the policies is closed. So I think we can start to see here that we've now got a situation where they've not got clean needles and syringes and they've got and in fact we're going to roll ahead a little bit so they are saying well are they sharp are they good enough and no and we think this might sound a bit crazy I was recently in Mozambique or like a couple of years ago I was in Mozambique before the introduction of, of NSP and drug users were desperate there and they told me that on average people reuse needles and syringes 20 times and then they sell them to somebody else. Now Mozambique, as Natalie said, have moved ahead to having a needle and syringe program, but that's the reality for people. In the UK before NSP, people used to sharpen needles and syringes on matchboxes because they were so blunt. So, yeah. okay, these guys might be a bit stupid, but they also may not have the opportunity, and they're stupid because in their country they do have NSP, but many drug users, it's not about being stupid, it's about not having the opportunity. So let's just roll this forward a little bit. I just boiled this kettle, so let's just, um, let's, uh, let's. And so now what Dum is doing is he's now decided to clean the syringes, which if you have to share is better than going ahead and using somebody else's needles and syringes. Yes. But you never clean with boiled water because boiling water will boil the fat in the blood into the syringe and it will bind into the syringe more deeply. So uh, I'll show you how cleaning in the presentation uh, later on, but never with can, boiling water. Connie? Can I mention something as well? Um, when we do outreach, what we teach our service beneficiaries, the best way is to have a brand new sterile syringe. Second of all, you use, you use the two by two by two method where you clean it with bleach and water. I'm not gonna explain the whole method here, I think. But right. the next best thing is to use the water that they get in the harm reduction packs, you know? It's um, saline water that they get with the, the needle and syringes and you flush that, the whole barrel 10 times with that water. That would be the best after having, if you can't find a brand new syringe. Right, so that's what, what uh, Connie is, is showing you there is what's called the, uh, a very common thing in harm reduction. We don't say do this, do that, because then it means that if people can't follow the gold standard, they may just do the worst possible practice. What Connie yes. is there is, well, sharing might be the worst practice, Clean kit, new kit for every hit is the best practice. Cold water bleach, cold water is the next best practice. Cold water, which you can get out of the, the sterile water amps, would be, of course, not using that water then to inject, but using the, that water, flushing it away, then using clean water again for your injection. Okay, the other things they go on to do is uh, they go on to drink alcohol just before they are taking a hit. 
We know that uh, drinking alcohol or taking any other type of depressant with heroin maximizes the chance of an overdose because one plus one equals three or five, not one plus one equals two. So it maximizes the effect. They were also using very large gauge needles. We'll talk about um, the, they actually need to use much smaller insulin needles. You also saw them licking the injection sites, licking the needles. Again, as Connie said, that brings lots of bacteria onto the uh, injecting site um, and uh, yeah, is pretty uh, disastrous. So thank you to Dim and Dom for showing us what not to do. Let me just get the presentation back. Now, Sorry, Matt. Can I just add something quickly there? Just one thing that people often forget to, to when they engage with the community, you know, they tell the community to use a sterile syringe. Whatever you do, don't share your syringes. So what happens with the community, you have 10 guys sitting in a circle. Each and every one has a clean, new, sterile syringe. But now they think they are safe, but then they go and they share the water or the tourniquet. I think um, people, well, outreach workers especially, and people that work with drug users need to reiterate, if you have a sterile syringe, doesn't mean you're 100% safe. You need to share nothing, not your syringe, not your water, not your tourniquet, not your cooker, nothing. So you might Thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. It's a very important point. So you heard me say, we used to have this slogan, which was one hit, one fit, which is the Australian term for a needle and a syringe for every hit, one fit for every hit. We now say one kit for every hit, because as Connie says, it's not just about the needles and syringes, it's also the cookers, it's also the water, it's all the other equipment that is particularly a route for hepatitis C, because hepatitis C is spread by much smaller droplets that are much more, much more virulent and stay alive for longer. Oh, hang on, I've got to keep on. So let's just run through some key principles of safer injecting because I don't want to move into our question and answer time. The key issue is we've got to understand how our venal circulation system works, and I'll show you in a minute. We must always inject towards the heart. So when you're thinking about your body, you're always injecting in the direction of the towards your heart. We understand there's different types of injecting, intramuscular, which is in the muscles or the buttock, subcutaneous, which is going under the skin, or uh, injecting directly into the vein. Now, what we must also remember is the vein is a very fragile system and it has little gates or filters that make sure the blood only goes in one direction towards the heart particularly if you engage in the practice of flushing, which is the process of pulling the needle in and out to suck blood into the syringe. When you do that, that collapses the internal structure of the vein and causes vein collapse. So here is a description of the uh, dialogue diagram of the body. You can see the veins are blue and the arteries are red. So arteries are full of bright red blood that is under a lot of pressure. It's oxygenated blood where the heart is drawing in oxygen from the lungs and pumping it, mixing it with the blood through the heart and pumping it out very, very fast through the arteries to the extremities of the body. We never inject in arteries because it's taking the blood away from the heart. And also it's, if you see in a horror movie or a slasher movie when people's blood gushes out, that's the blood coming out of arteries. Veins is much darker blood, and this is the arteries where it's moving blood towards the heart um, much more slowly. So this is bringing the blood, once the oxygen has been largely stripped out, it's brought back slower to the heart. And what we do is we inject drugs into those veins, so it comes, mixes, and goes into our brain. If we look at this model here, it describes um, uh, the, the different risks of different sites. So the green, the lower arms, particularly in our, in, in, in our elbow and the back of our arms, these are what we call the low risk sites, lower risk sites. They're the 
places where most people start injecting. Then we can look at the lower legs, the top of our chest here and our hands. These are medium wrist sites. And then our groin and neck um, and head, these are all high risk sites. People who've really damaged their venal system can end up injecting in the groin and even some inject in the neck. But this is a very high risk practice because your artery and your nerves are wrapped around each other and it's very easy to hit your artery or your nerves by mistake. One of the things I wanted to highlight here is what Connie picked up early, which is about the idea of harm reduction hierarchies. It is really unhelpful to say to people who inject drugs, don't do this, do this. What we should be saying is, here is a range of options. This is the most dangerous that you're trying to avoid, and this is the best, purest option. So for example, in this case, we can be talking about saying, um, if you have the best option, the best option is to use water from sterile lamps. But if you don't have access to sterile lamps, what is the next best option? So water boiled in a kettle is next best. Then water flushed straight from a cold tap is next best. And then water from a hot tap is the best after that. And you work your way down. It is remarkable how many people are using saliva, urine, toilet water, water off the tops of cars, and not understanding the different risks. So actually, as Connie said earlier, the last thing I would want to put in my injection is my saliva. I would actually rather use puddle water than saliva. Um, now, but many people think, well, saliva is my body, so it's not going to be that much of a problem, but it really is. So the key message here is to one, give people advice about how to give people advice about water, but more importantly, whenever you give advice, give it as a hierarchy, give people options, because many people who inject drugs live in restricted circumstances and they need to do the best they can in that moment. Okay. Key message around hand washing. I think we've all learned to wash our hands a lot better recently because of COVID-19. So I'm not gonna lecture you about the process of uh, hand washing. I'm sure you're all now used to the 20 seconds singing happy birthday to yourself twice uh, while you're washing your hands. The one thing we would say then, this was a campaign we ran, at, whatever else you do, remember that the highest risk situation is when you come out of the toilet both because of your own feces, but also because other people's feces will be in that environment. And lots of viruses and bacteria are spread through feces. So whatever you do, make sure you wash your hands as you come out of the toilet. Now, hopefully we're all doing it a lot more than that now, um, but um, at least do that. So let's just go through the equipment. In fact, I'm gonna move forward. So the other thing I want to highlight to you is, a new tactic that we're trying to manage is this idea of a protected using space. Now, a protected using space is essentially no more complicated than taking a piece of paper, putting it on the table, and then putting the equipment that you're going to use. So taking my syringe, taking my uh, spoon, and putting them all in the, on the piece of paper. I've, of course, washed my hands before I did this. Then, nobody touches what's in that piece of paper uh, while I'm using. It stops things like, oh, let me just borrow your lighter. And I put blood on the lighter, you pick up the lighter, use it, and blood has been transferred. So by having a protected using space, it's about learning infection control techniques and applying them within a drug using setting. If you find yourself needing to clean your needles and syringes, it's a three stage process. You take cold, fresh water, you draw it up, you shake it around in the syringe, you flush it out and you repeat that at least three times. Then you do the same with pure bleach, draw it up. Just watch out that in the picture, it looks like they're damaging the end of the needle by sticking it in the glass. So you'd be careful not to damage the needle. Draw up pure bleach, shake it around, spray it away and again do that at least three times and then finally you reflush with cold water again. I would do that definitely if I'm using somebody else's needle and syringe 
And at a minimum, I would, even when I'm reusing my own syringe, I would flush with cold water at the very least to make sure that no, there's no residues or infection inside, bacteria that's grown inside the syringe. So I wanted just to go through with you the, the range of harm reduction commodities that are given, that we recommended for the Nigerian harm reduction program. Because, you know, in the back of my car where we've got the mobile needle and syringe program for my local area, we've got six different types of needles, four different types of barrels and a whole range of other equipment. Now, that's great. But when you're setting up a needle and syringe program for the first time, you need to think, where do we start? And introducing too much complexity from the start can be challenging. And it's also challenging from, from, from a procurement point of view as well. So we, with advice from Exchange Supplies, we really had a, a hard discussion about what type of equipment should we be giving out. And we agreed that this type of one mil insulin syringe should be the baseline and that we would then have a one mil barrel like this with a five eighths green needle as a backup and then a two mil and a blue needle as the third stage. I would like to have other needles in there personally, but I think as a baseline to start, these three cover you for injecting in different sites with different levels of scarring, and they also would give you an ability to intramuscular inject as well. We would also recognise, as Connie was highlighting, injecting is not just about needles and syringes. We also would be thinking about giving out water, tourniquets, cookers, uh, potentially filters, depending on what drugs people are using, one or two alcohol wipes, Alcohol wipes are useful both as a means of cleaning your injecting site and also as a way of creating heat. Filters as cotton uh, disposal and then bins uh, to put needles away at the end. So increasingly we are arguing that people should be buying low dead space syringes. These are syringes as you can see from the diagram that remove the nipple that becomes a reservoir for blood uh, being in the syringe. Now, if we can, these types of insulin syringes are naturally low dead space because they don't have a, a needle, a, a nipple, but these types of bigger syringes have a nipple at the top and low dead space syringes are very clever. They just have, see one here, they just have, um, uh, Where's the thing? They just have a little a pin in the middle that slots into the into the nipple in the top of the barrel, and that fills the dead space, removes the reservoir. And it's important when you're having procurement discussions with your advocacy to argue that we you know we should be on a journey towards having low dead space syringes as normal. Barrels don't need to change because it's the needle makes the barrel low dead space. Final point, and I'm going to then move towards uh, the questions and answer session. Final question is, why don't we reuse needles and syringes? So I talked about Mozambique people reusing potentially their syringes, uh, the needles and syringes 20 times. This is a, a view of a needle and syringe under a microscope. This is what happens. Well, you can see the left hand side is what happens before use. The middle one is what happens after one use and look how bent it is after just six uses. Now imagine what it looks like after 20 things. When you withdraw a needle like this, you can feel it pulling on the internal structure of your vein. So this is why uh, if we want people's vein health to remain strong and we want them to stay away from the high risk injecting sites, people need sharp needles. If you are in a country with um, a, a, a base form of brown heroin, like a, a Afghan heroin, you're going to need to add an acidifier. And we know also that another very significant area of risk is putting too much acidifier in your uh, cooking up. So one of the things we really encourage people is to start low, go slow and put a small amount in and really only use the minimum amount in surveys that Magdalena Harris has done, she's shown that people are injecting often solutions that have a pH that is very similar to vinegar. So um, I think no, one of the things that, that's why in the UK, 
most drug users using for more than 10 years are going into the groin because their venal system has been destroyed. I meet drug users in Myanmar where they're injecting China White. 10 years later, they're still injecting into their arms. So this is part of the, the challenges of people not being able to use the right drugs, which is another challenge of prohibition. So look, I think we should stop here and let's um, see if there's anybody who wants to uh, ask us uh, any questions. Have we got people coming in? Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to launch a quick poll, a mid-webinar poll, so you can just, uh, if you see it pop up, just, just answer it. For the question and answer session, either you can put your questions in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand. There's a raise your hand function uh, on the, uh, in Zoom. And then I will unmute you so you can ask your question directly to the panel. Uh, however, to start it off, while people uh, might be thinking about questions, um, I want to actually ask Matt, uh, Connie, and um, Natalie, if you can briefly sort of elaborate how, if you've, if you've seen or heard or um, experienced any sort of uh, shift with the recent COVID crisis and the provision of NSP, of needle and syringe programs for people who use drugs, because I know, for example, in South Africa, there has been a very strong crackdown from the police on everything. Uh, and this is different for every country. So, 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 so what are your sort of views on, on how should we be dealing in this crisis where obviously there are lockdown services might be shut down? Like what are the challenges that, uh, th that we need to deal with? Um, so if you could answer that and for others, please uh, use the raise your hand function or I'll put a question in the chat uh, for the panelists. Yes. Connie, do you want to go first in terms of South Africa? Yes, uh, yes I'll, I'll sort of go first. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that is, is a very important question to ask. And what we've noticed is uh, because of the lockdown in South Africa, a lot of services couldn't be, you know, we have a saying where we say we meet the person where they are at, you know. So when the outreach outreach workers were stopped delivering services, it was it had a huge impact on on our our community members' health. You know, not just that. Um, a lot of the the guys that I worked with, a lot of them were arrested because um, on the charge sheet it said. Um, breaking lockdown protocols. So whether they were sitting in, in jail, withdrawing, and not having access to methadone or anything to OST, opiate substitution therapy or nothing. But just the, the guys were crying to me saying, where's the guys with the syringes? We need to get them out. And all I could do is try, I, I actually took in my backpack and I distributed it from my side itself. Um, and that helped, but it was a major, major knock for the guys, not just health-wise, but it felt to them like, you know, they didn't matter. But um, things are better now, so hopefully things will get better as as the months go on. Fantastic. Natalie, do you, do you have anything to add from your side? Yes, so thanks, thanks, Connie, and thanks, Hagen, for the question. So, um, yes, in uh, in uh, in Mauritius, I mean, we had a we had a lockdown of uh, more than two months, and the thing is, uh, they just announced the lockdown, and then that was it we were basically in the lockdown so nobody had time to prepare uh, not even the health services not even the ngos not even the peers so uh, and the thing is that at the beginning of a lot lockdown a lot of uh, essential services that were not considered essential were basically not available and that unfortunately included a uh, needle and syringe program so at the beginning of the lockdown uh, it just wasn't there uh, i don't know if the reasoning behind was that uh, okay this is a lockdown situation so nobody use drug nobody inject i, I don't know uh, or maybe I, I think that maybe the, the 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 authorities, including the health services, didn't really have time to to prepare. Neither did the, the I mean nobody had time to prepare because it just it happened. And really, the sad thing uh, about that is that. The, 
there are some people who are uh, um, keeping their old syringes uh, to to give it back to the um, to the needle and syringe program, um, uh, and people have uh, just uh, um, because they usually uh, put it like in a bottle, like in a plastic bottle, and then give the plastic bottle full of used syringes to the needle and syringe program. But the thing is that uh, since uh, um, syringes were not available, some people just took their um, uh, plastic bottle, open it, and, and use the, the, um, the used syringes. And but there was also, there's also the situation where some people uh, keep this plastic bottle with their used syringes, but then they don't keep it at home because of, in case the police come, so they just keep it in a, I mean, in the community somewhere. Um, uh, it's still safe because it's in a, in a plastic uh, bottle. Uh, I mean, it's as safe as it can be. Uh, but the thing is that people just went uh, out and just uh, saw um, uh, plastic bottles of other, I mean, just random uh, uh, used equipment that was, uh, that was uh, like hidden in the, in, the, in the communities. And they, uh, they just used it because they really didn't have a choice. And uh, I know that the, some peers have been, uh, just because they happen to have a little stock uh, of clean syringes in their houses because of the running of the usual running of the needle and syringe program. They just have um, managed to go like really illegally sneaking out and going to to see uh, uh, members of the community and giving out what they could. But they, this uh, uh, didn't uh, last long because there was not a lot of, of stock in the in the house of, 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 of users. Basically, the stock is kept. Uh, in the in the in the organization, so uh, th this was a uh, health food, but for uh, um, a short period of time. So um, after some time, the the services came back. But I think it's really really worth mentioning the fact that uh, when the services came back, the 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 civil society organization and most specifically the peers played such an amazing role in the in the lockdown because the government services couldn't go out a lot of organizations didn't have the 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 um the authority the um uh, the, the access pass to, to 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 work but they the the peers they just they just went everywhere they could go in all the little you know knocking at people's houses because they it's part of a it's one community so people know each other people know where uh, the community members are living and they and the um the role of the peers were really critical um, um I, I think and uh, uh, but now uh, we've been trying to um put together some recommendation uh, in case we have, because we're out of lockdown now in, now in Mauritius. So in case we have a second wave of COVID, because we don't know we're seeing second waves in different countries, but in case we have uh, second waves uh, uh, coming by with a recommendation, I mean, uh, we just happened to, to have the, uh, the country dialogue for the Global Fund, and I was working on the country dialogue, and we had this conversation uh, about uh, uh, lockdown. What are the recommendations? What are the simple things that can be done uh, just uh, as a simple thing is just recognize harm reduction as being an essential service recognize the peer the peer workers and the civil society organization as being essential workers that they will not have to go and 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 run here and there trying to get some access pass but just being able to go out in the field and give the services because they just all recognize as such so these are the things that we can we can just uh, prepare ourselves in case it comes again. So that was my, my, uh, my a, I wanted to share. From the UK point. So we're just gonna um, unmute Kennedy so he can speak. Uh, but just to, to add a comment from the UK, the UK has been, I'm very proud of the UK. We've actually been off on this lost 15 years of moving away from harm reduction, getting into this very recovery orientated cost cutting agenda. But when the lockdown took place, our government was very slow into the lockdown, so we had actually got two weeks to prepare, which is why so many people have died in the UK. However, as drug services pulled back, drug user groups stepped up. And you know, the reason my car is full of needles and syringes is that since the lockdown, and I've stopped drug, I've been giving out 1,500 needles and syringes every week through drug suppliers and drug uh, users in my hometown. And that's 
become the big narrative and that's why the euro input poster for support don't punish day says time for a new normal because this is the future that we want kennedy welcome mm -hmm. thank you so much uh, matt and uh, thank you so much to everyone there mm. Uh, very good presentation, Matt, and uh, we are learning each and every time that we hear from you. Uh, my question is mostly about the uh, issues to do with the mobilization. Uh, maybe Connie can help us to, I'm calling from Zambia, where we have very, very strict laws in terms of uh, needle exchange programs. Now, even just having a needle itself is even more dangerous than to have an actual drug from the law enforcement. So in terms of mobilization, how best, because I, I joined late and I didn't hear the first part of mobilization when Matt was making, when Connie was making the presentation. So how best can we reach the heart to reach you know, members of our communities? Because here in Zambia, it's not an easy thing. So our organization is just try by all means to find a better way of doing it. There's a small program that we are doing in one of the small towns just outside Lusaka, where we are trying to provide HIV services with uh, our clients, and most of them are using uh, injections. So now for those places that are hard to reach, how best did you do it for you guys who are in South Africa? Probably you can just respond to that. And in terms of um, COVID programs in Zambia, it is really difficult even to present these programs because most of the people that we intend to, those that we are working with and those that we intend to work with, uh, literally do not even want to see people coming to them because they are fearing that maybe there are some people that are hiding into health, health people instead, and instead there are people that are coming from law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kennedy. Connie, uh, so we'll go to Donald afterwards. Um, Connie, do you want to maybe provide a response to that? Yes, yes. Thank you, um, Matt. Um, you know, it, it's a very difficult question um, to actually answer that uh, every country is different. Um, every community you need to um, approach differently. We started off with a formative assessment to show the need for a needle and syringe program. And after that data was collected, um, we still struggled, but we managed to get ethical approval to deliver services after two years. But it, it's still frowned upon by a lot of um, higher ups. But I must say we are very lucky in Chwane is the area where I'm from, the, like um, the province, if you could put it that way. With all the advocacy work that we've done in the last couple of years and all the, the positive change that um, these policy makers and the people that are in power saw us do, um, I think we are a lot further than the other provinces in South Africa. So, you know, we've learned from what other countries have done and we've adapted it to uh, the South African context. And I think what you can do is if you look, if you concentrate on advocacy work, you also show the powers that be that the main aspect of it is to stop people from getting infected with HIV. Also, a big killer in South Africa at the moment is hepatitis C, so HCV. And if you can show them the data, like um, in the previous presentation or when Matt opened up, he said there's 11 interventions uh, from the WHO that shows it is essential when you have substance users or injecting substance users, if you have this, these 11 interventions and needle and syringes is the number one intervention, then you cannot go wrong. But I just, you know, every country is different, but we can definitely try and, you know, disseminate data and help each other also. You know, we're after all um, a network of people who work in these um, projects and with this, these communities. Thanks. So I, I think the other point to really make there is community mobilization is of course challenging in highly criminalized situations. So I was working with MDM in, in Kachin in Myanmar um, in 2017. 
and where you've got sort of anti-drugs groups and you've also got you no know, very aggressive policing of course it's challenging but by being able to move through peer networks you can avoid the heavy criminalization what you do need to do though is have policies for what happens when your workers get arrested i mean mdm saw two peer workers put in jail for two years for distributing needles and syringes so we really need to look at um Yes, if we're asking peers to take the high risk of being at the front, that's great, but we've really got to back them up. When that I saw we have Donald asking a question. Can we bring Donald on? Is that possible? Oh, here he is. Hi, Donald. You need to come off mute. Hi, how are you guys? Hey, nice to hear you. Yeah, nice to hear you. So, so uh, thanks for sharing um, uh, the data that you've shared, also the information. Uh, it was really helpful for sharing those information. But actually, uh, making a follow up on the uh, last uh, question that was raised by uh, from uh, I can't remember the name from Zambia. Uh, us also, I'm, I'm uh, talking from uh, Zimbabwe, where we have also siege in the laws there in the country, where criminalization is just the norm. Uh, actually, to be caught with uh, any substance, it's, it's an arrest that it. At the, at the sport. So I was wondering, how can we make, uh, you have said about advocacy and also working with data, but I was uh, suggesting that uh, how can we uh, make maybe a regional, a regional uh, campaign on a policy shift as uh, in the SADAC region, for, for perhaps uh, starting from the SADAC region and also expanding outwards in, in Africa and also in the in other region. But it will be minimum, at least you start uh, on a regional basis. That was my, my suggestion that I was just pulling a goal. So maybe you can run a campaign or something. Yeah, thank you, Donald. I think that's a really, I think that's a really important point for uh, both the policy networks in Africa and also for key advocacy partners like Arasa uh, and also the key drug user network like Africa Input to really start thinking about how you gather case studies and evidence from the Africa region, because. Yes, we know that harm reduction can be adapted and tailored to different national contexts, but I know when we took the Nigerian delegation from Nigeria to meet the, the harm reduction providers in Kenya, they said it was so much more powerful to have an African country talking to another African country than the Kenyans who had to go to the US to learn when they were first adopting their practice. So I think your recommendation is a very useful one. I'm just going to screen share for one uh, more moment just to before we finish to cover one topic I uh, just um, from the side. just to cover one last thing on issues of disposal because um, I did uh, this was uh, just the last issue on some standards. So when the conversations Connie and I were having earlier on was about the importance of disposal, we don't link and make disposal condition, uh, we don't make uh, delivery disposal, uh, so we don't make, make distribution conditional on uh, disposal, on returns, but we do pay a lot of attention to safe disposal because it really impacts on the community attitudes towards needle and syringe programs and people who use drugs if there's lots of needles and syringes left discarded in the community. So, and we also understand that's why advocacy is so important because in highly criminalized settings, people are actually more likely to throw needles away than less likely because they're too fearful to carry them and return them. So the first key thing is, if you have a needle and syringe, uh, the key is recap it. Recap your own needles, not other people's needles. Then, um, yeah, so don't recap other needle people. These types of hard, sharps proof bins are, are ideal and they can be opened and then you can push in the, in the needle, throw it away safely. The key thing is if you don't have this type of uh, um, casing, then you can use a clear plastic water bottle. Don't use tin cans because people collecting recycling could have sharps injuries. So use clear plastic water bottles that people can see contain needles and syringes. You'll then have a very big sort of master bin, these types of much larger bins back in the, in the either in the supplier's houses or in and then an even bigger bin back in the fixed site where all the equipment will be thrown away and then safely stored until it can be burnt. Um, 
one of the reasons we don't punish people for not returning equipment is that people might be safely throwing their equipment away in bins in their dealers houses in their friends houses so if people don't return the equipment the response is to have a discussion with them to understand what they're doing and to understand whether there is a problem um, and if we um, Yes, and so therefore what we do as well is we only ever fill bins or bottles two thirds full, otherwise there's a risk of needles uh, uh, sticking out. Okay, equipment that you need to deliver needle and syringe programs. Um, so equipment, firstly bins, if you don't, and a whole range of bins from the small personal ones through to the large mother bins that you have back at your fixed site. Plastic water bottles as a pragmatic backup. Again, always the hierarchy of options in harm reduction. Make sure your staff have strong boots when they're going out doing outreach because people, we don't want staff having, uh, or peers having uh, sharp sticking into their, into their feet. If people are being peer workers for you, then you should be looking at their feet. I've seen lots of peer workers walking around in different countries with flip flops. And because they're peer workers, um, they're not given the same attention as the paid staff. That's not appropriate. If you're asking someone to work for you, they should be fully equipped. And that includes having robust shoots that stop needle stick injuries. If people are picking up equipment, then we need uh, litter pickers or Kevlar gloves that stop people getting injuries. Finally, we can also do three specialist forms of disposal. One is what we call nip here needle patrol, done very effectively in Copenhagen by the Bruggen Forgenen, the drug user network, also by peers in uh, many different countries where drug users go around collecting needles and syringes and removing from them from the community. In Copenhagen, the local community can even ring up the drug user group and draw them in to know where waste is around. We can also engage in community cleanup operations. These are very useful when you're introducing needle and syringe program. Go and sort out the problem with the discarded needles before you start talking to the community about doing a needle and syringe program. Show them that you are the solution to the problems, not the cause of the problems. And then having fixed site disposal bins in public toilets alongside public injecting areas. These give drug users the chance to return their needles and syringes uh, uh, safely without the risk of carrying them. And I said to you I would finish with another UN resource. This is the UN resource that captures the evidence that shows that needle and syringe programs work. They analysed a whole load of cities that had NSP and compared them with cities that didn't have NSP and the impact on HIV rates was self-evident. When you have NSP you give people who inject drugs the chance to practice harm reduction and to use drugs more safely. And this is the key message in this, the first webinar in this series called Treat Us Right. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Hajin just to say some final comments. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Matt, for facilitating, uh, to Natalie and to Connie for being great panelists. We are right on time to finish, uh, so I would also like to uh, thank all the attendees. I want to highlight this is the first of a series of webinars we're doing. Um, the next webinar will be on uh, opioid overdose management and uh, uh, naloxone. Um, we are starting with the more sort of practical aspects and I know for some of the people who attend that are doing a lot more advocacy work that this might sound um, like, like things that are not necessarily that interesting, but I think it's very important for us that if we are advocates who end up going to United Nations meeting or who end up talking to politicians, that we understand the nitty gritty aspects of what does it mean to inject drugs? What are the practicalities? Because it's so easy to make mistakes or so easy to, with the best of intentions, advocate for something that might have a harmful if, uh, uh, effect on the community, especially in these times. So, and for those who, who, who definitely are um, interested in uh, uh, drug policy, so the last of the webinars will be specifically about drug policy. Um, so please do check out for the announcement for the future webinars. 
And a lot of people in the chat have been asking for the resources. So we have all your email addresses and we will be sending uh, 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 packages with the links and the resources through to all of you from this webinar. Uh, Connie, did you want to say something less? I saw your hand. Yes, I just wanted to know um, on the overdose management, do you, don't, do you have a time and a date maybe or not yet? Uh, yes, we do have a time. The time is the same. It will be, we're doing the webinars every other week. So the next webinar will be the 16th of July and it will be at uh, basically mm. at 2.30 uh, uh, p.m. South African time, which for those in East Africa is uh, 3.30. And uh, the link, uh, the link will be also. We will share the link online uh, for people to register in advance, uh, which really helps. I'm not so sure what Thank it is you. European time, but uh, if if from South African to European time, I'm not entirely sure how that works. Uh, uh, it it usually is like an hour or two hours to London time, depending on um, uh, if it's winter or summer, but yeah. it's more or less the same. Yeah. So we're all 2.30 South African time. Yeah. yeah. So um, I also want to urge everybody to, after this will finish, you will be guided to a link to uh, complete a quick evaluation. It will take one minute. The reason why is this is one of the first webinars that we're doing. And as Arasa, we want to do this more to reach more people. So please do take a moment to uh, complete the four or five questions that I have uh, in the final evaluation forum that you will be guided to after the webinar ends. So without further ado, I, if there's nothing else from the panelists, I would like to thank everyone and then uh, 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 close, the, uh, uh, close our first webinar. Uh, to note, the video will be available on Facebook and on YouTube. Fantastic. I just want to finalize, um, give my last input. If there's any questions from anyone on this webinar or even that um, see this on Facebook, you can contact me on Facebook or if you can email me if there's any questions in the South African context, if you want to know about substance use or problematic substance use or needle and syringe programs or community mobilization in South Africa, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thanks. Thank you for you, Hijin, and thank you, Matt, and thank you, everyone. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we have reached the end of our first webinar, and we do hope to see all of you for our next webinars. We have three more coming up, and uh, they're interesting and very important topics. Thank you very much, and have a good Thursday. Goodbye. <laughs>